right, I think we can go ahead and start. A nice little group we have here. What we're excited to do today is really probably something that'll be a regular type of program that we do at Open Air, particularly as our advocacy continues to expand, is to just have these teach-ins really for our members around different policies that we're developing, particularly when they're at a stage where we're trying to recruit more folks from within the community to participate in them. And so the one that we're going to be talking about today is one that we're really excited about. It's been quite a process in the making. It's been led by our very own uh, Open Air Super member, Toby Bryce, who you'll see in a second with uh, Mega Raghavan and Jamie Rogers and a number of other people. And this is a state policy, like our previous work with LECLA, that focuses on the procurement of carbon dioxide by states as a way of ramping up carbon dioxide removal technologies over the next few years, which we know is critically important to bring the cost down. So we're gonna get into that uh, as the first part of the presentation, kind of going over what the policy is. We'll pause, take some questions, and then the second part of the presentation, we'll get into what missions are, uh, what this would look like really from an activist perspective uh, in terms of how our community does it. So I'll lay out uh, some of our experience with our uh, past policy campaign and how that applies to the present and give you a sense of what it's like to participate and what are the different opportunities or roles that you might be able to play if this is something you wanna get involved in. So just a bit on open air, we're a global volunteer network, entirely volunteer uh, driven, entirely uh, virtual that's focused on advancing carbon dioxide removal. We have a very active, creative part of our community that's focused on making things. That's our sort of R&D wing, uh, which you can take a look at on our Discord. And then the other side uh, is our advocacy wing. And so we're the folks who come up with policy ideas, uh, create those policies, try to get them introduced on the state municipal level in ways that can either directly or indirectly support carbon dioxide removal. We're based on Discord. This is like a uh, Slack-like uh, platform. That's really where all the kind of magic happens there and, and uh, many Zooms throughout the week. Uh, we really kicked off in February 2020 when we started our Zoom. Uh, we're, we just got about 30 people who joined yesterday. So I don't know what the current number is, but we're at about 400 members uh, with representation on five continents. A lot of people in North America where we started, but increasingly global profile. And really what the building blocks of our community are what we call missions. So we're really uh, about learning and sharing information, but ultimately all in the service of accomplishing things in the real world that are gonna accelerate CDR development. And so those are called missions, defined projects that are either related to R&D or to advocacy. And so what we're talking about today is an example of policy advocacy. What I'm going to do is just hand off to Toby and Mega, two key members of the mission here, and they're going to explain the policy, a little bit of background, and also give a little bit of background on what we mean by CDR. So Toby and Mega, take it away. All right, great. So to get started, why CDR? And I think we want to go through a few things. I just want to start off with a few resources that we think are really good on this topic. I think Chris will put some links to them in the chat, but... These are all really good resources if you're learning about CDR or if you have particular bits of it that you want to go deeper on and understand more about. If you're just getting started, especially I think the CDR removal uh, primer is one that we all think is a great resource uh, that's super comprehensive. Um, so hopefully those links will be in the chat. And then really we want to get into why CDR and why CDRLA in this presentation today. So I think, you know, most of you will be familiar with the idea of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius or even 1.5 degrees Celsius to, to avoid the worst effects and, you know, catastrophic impacts that climate change can have. And what we're seeing with a lot of recent research, including the UN's most recent IPCC report, is in order to do, to do that, even putting kind of a complete and immediate end to emissions is no longer going to be enough given the amount of historical emissions that have already happened. So we really need to be pulling carbon out of the air and doing that at the gigaton scale in order to stay within kind of a safe temperature range. And that's kind of, you know, what underlies a lot of the policy that we're thinking about. Um, this is just a great quote from Holly Jean Buck, who is a great authority on all of this, basically saying, you know, why this is such an imperative and why, based on the emissions that have happened so far, this is really necessary. And then another one from Professor Olufemi Taiwo explaining how governments are simply, you know, slow to accept this, slow to act, and slow to really get started in doing something about this. So thinking a little bit about the policy context for CDR, there are some positive developments, even though, as we said, governments are a bit slow to act on this. 
So some of the positive developments that we've seen that are creating opportunities for CDR is kind of the momentum we're starting to see behind net zero commitments. And, you know, the number of companies, city, states, different entities that are already making commitments to reach net zero at some point in the future. The thing with net zero is it kind of almost automatically breaks down into two parts. There's a component of it, which is reducing uh, emissions, which, you know, has been a big focus and needs to continue to be a focus to drive us down to net zero. But then the other part to it is inevitably there's going to be some amount of emissions that are just going to be technologically difficult to reduce or, you know, reducing them in a certain way would be inequitable to certain groups of people, which you're going to be left with and need to somehow balance out if you're going to get to net zero. Um, And what we're starting to see is that the states and cities that are making their net zero commitments are starting to do the math and figure out what percentage of emissions can and can we not really do away with. Um, And we're typically getting a range of around 10 to 15 percent of emissions that we're ultimately going to have to balance out some other way. And that's really where CDR comes in as the best way of doing that. And so right now, even though there is no current policy commitments that explicitly incorporate CDR into emission strategies and targets, we think 2022 is kind of set up to be a year when we can start to get some of these policies on the board. We can start to get CDR going uh, in a much bigger way. We are primarily looking to states as opposed to the federal government. And the reason for that is that states in North America um, are already really far ahead of the federal government when we think about setting net zero goals, um, exploring CDR, at least initially. And we believe that, you know, alone and together, they're the ones that can really play a role in leading the movement and kicking it off. And ultimately, at being the ones that kind of drive the industry forward, drive it to scale up and drive down costs. Uh, Aside from kind of the moral imperative to do this, Um, States who kind of act early on this and make a significant commitment to it also have a pretty significant economic upside that they can realize. So we've seen estimates from uh, Carbon 180 and the New York Times suggesting that the carbon industry could be a trillion dollar industry. So that's really a substantial value that states can capture if they act on this and become leaders in the space. Um, And that's essentially what CDRLA is all about. So What we talk about with CDRLA is essentially levering, leveraging the power of procurement, because really procurement is one of the highest impact tools that governments can have that can make a difference at the early stages of a market and kind of driving it forward, basically using their purchasing power as a huge entity to drive a market that's really in its early stages like CDR. And we've already kind of seen this in a lot of different markets for the better part of a century now. So federal and state governments have really leveraged procurement as an aspect of their innovation policy and have used it to kind of create the early markets for certain technologies that they know are going to be strategically important. And that's included other types of climate tech so far, like solar, uh, batteries, LEDs, and other things already. And the kind of critical thing that procurement policy can do is to help scale up market, market ready innovations. So when you know something is ready to deploy, um, and it's kind of looking for a market to sell into, the government can be that big early adopter that creates the demand and sort of gives companies that are doing this room to grow and scale up. And both state and federal governments really have a huge amount of resources that they can play in this role. So, you know, when you think about how much money they're really deploying, it's orders of magnitude more than something like venture capital. So they really have um, a significant amount of power to kind of be uh, a market driver in in CDR when it's so new. And so the critical thing, I think, thinking about using policy to scale up adoption of this technology is basically, this is the way to drive costs down, um, you know, to provide economies of scale as we help these markets grow from their infancy to just scaling up and also give companies that do CDR a chance to learn by doing and kind of drive their costs down that way. And for us, that's really the focus of advocacy and policy in this decade. Um, You know, how much carbon dioxide can we really take out of the air this decade is kind of unclear since it's so new, but really that's less important than just being as successful as we can in driving the cost down, getting these companies to scale up and getting to a point where huge gigaton scale CDR could even be possible in 10, 20, 30 years. The other thing I think that the government can do that's uh, really important through procurement is to lay down a track, which is basically, you know, accelerating the development of standards. In the case of CDR, that would be things like measurement, legal liabilities, siting and permitting of geological storage, things like that. So these are all things that we kind of have to learn and get better at and iterate on over time if we're going to scale CDR up. And in the process of building up those frameworks and kind of the early stage of procurement, getting these CDR solutions out into the market, we can kind of confirm and validate the different approaches and understand which of the high potential ideas that are currently out there um, might actually work. 
and get to a point where we have an understanding of those things by the time we really need to scale up. Uh, I think one place where open air has really seen and leveraged the power of procurement is through um, LECLA. So this was our first uh, advocacy mission. LECLA stands for the Low Embodied Carbon Concrete Leadership Act. And this is state legislation, which basically uses government procurement to decarbonize concrete. We got a version of it passed in New York last spring, which is super exciting. There's also another version that is close to passing in New Jersey, and we're getting it introduced in Virginia. And this has all been based on open air member actions. So we've really seen the, the power of this kind of you know, collective work through LECLA. We also have some reference points to draw from you know, other types of CDR procurement that we've seen uh, in the last year, companies like Stripe, Shopify, and Microsoft, which have essentially, you know, through the private sector, made a commitment to buy X amount of CDR in the next few years um, with the idea that you know, they know these markets are still new, they know these technologies are still expensive, but really they see it as an investment into some of the most promising CDR technology. And they really led the way in kind of making some big investments into some of the companies that have emerged in the last few years. We also know of one federal bill, which has been drafted, not yet introduced, that would direct the federal government to procure CDR from uh, DAT companies, so direct air capture. Um, and that was in Representative Paul Tonko from upstate New York. So there's a couple of reference points we're looking to as we develop CDRLA. And now I'm going to turn it over to Toby to talk a little bit more about the details of the policy. Thank you. All right. And uh, everyone, you know, as you have, if you have questions as we go along, either about what Mega or Chris were talking about, or what I'm going to talk about, please put them in the Q&A box, and we will open up for questions after this very brief overview of what's going on in New York. So as Chris mentioned, and Mega alluded to, um, the CDR, CDRLA, the legislation, we came up with the idea, we talked to a bunch of experts, and we've actually drafted a bill. And this is an entirely all-volunteer effort from the open air membership. Um, we talked to probably 40 or 50 experts, and we talked to dozens of folks from academia, industry, and advocacy communities to kind of, it's sort of, we did a listening tour to just get a bunch of ideas about about the topic in general and get feedback as we started to develop our sort of specific point of view on the legislation. As Mega mentioned, we are focused on states and um, integrating a CDR procurement with existing emissions reductions and net zero targets. Any net zero target has an implicit CDR target because as Mega said, you're, we're not gonna be able to reduce all of the emissions and certainly not as quickly and completely as we need to. And then, you know, beyond that, we obviously have the historical um, legacy of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere that CDR will be required to tackle. But every net zero target implicitly has a CDR target in it. And what CDRLA wants to do is make that an explicit target. The bill, as Chris mentioned, can be adapted to any sort of state or even municipal or national government context. And obviously, as Mega mentioned, private companies are starting to do this as well. We started in New York. Meg is working on this already in California. Um, and then there are several other states where we've got some very nascent efforts. So the idea is to make this a multi-state mission. You know, we started in New York, but it would be great if the bill gets passed first somewhere else. So we're definitely working um, kind of all hands on deck on multiple fronts on this. Just to give a sense of where the bill comes from in New York, and again, this context will vary state by state. Some states do have net zero legislation, other states don't. And so the bill is applicable, again, to any context. But in a net zero context, it, you know, there's a very clear application because, as I mentioned, there is a, an implicit CDR target in any net zero commitment. New York passed really landmark climate legislation in 2019, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. The bill mandates net zero by 2050. It's based on an emissions baseline from 1990. That's approximately 410 million tons of CO2 equivalent. 85% of those emissions reductions are to be achieved by decarbonization of you know, energy, power, transportation, and building sectors. There's an in, there are interim goals, like by 2030 and by 2040, we're supposed to be at a certain point. So you know, obviously, with any net zero commitment, the end goal is great, but it's at least as important that we start getting working on it immediately today. The remaining 15%, and Mega alluded to this, um, and this is explicit in the bill, um, are deemed to be hard to abate emissions. And the bill does include some language around quote unquote offsets to, to deal with this remaining 15% that will not be decarbonized um, or achieve via emissions reductions. But the language is very unsatisfactory. It is not net zero aligned. It does not require that these hard to abate emissions be offset by removals. 
you can basically offset them with anything, renewable energy credits, very low quality addition, you know, additional, um, non-additional uh, emissions reductions credits. Um, and so we want to basically rewrite that to make them into a requirement for hard carbon removal. If you're going to emit a ton of CO2, you have to take out a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere to offset that. So that's where CDRLA comes in. Again, this is a direct state procurement program. We explored a couple of different uh, mechanisms. Uh, we looked at a compliance mechanism like the low carbon fuel standard in California. We settled on procurement for some reasons that MEGA has alluded to. Um, we think it's a very powerful mechanism. We also think that it allows states to factor in ideas like equity, environmental justice, industrial development and jobs benefits, ecosystem co-benefits in a way that a compliance mechanism where the actual emitters are out buying their own credits does not, just won't do. The policy is technology agnostic and standards-based. This means that we're not telling, we're not saying, you know, to the state or the procuring body what specific CDR they have to acquire, whether it's DAC or forest carbon or, or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage or biochar, what the bill does is, is outline out a, a set of standards that the CDR has to comply with, and then the market can compete, you know, as to what the best solution is. And these standards are the bill, you know, these are, you know, familiar terms if you have been reading up on CDR. The CDR project has to be additional, meaning that it would not have occurred without the state procurement under this legislation. The CDR must actually be removed. It can't be an emissions reduction. It can't be avoided emissions. It has to be actually taken out of the atmosphere with a minimum durability of 100 years. Um, that number could be higher, but in New York, we want we want to be to to allow some sort of bio based CDR mechanisms like biochar, uh, potentially some forest product uh, CDR like cross laminated tim timber to be able to qualify to make the the um, applicability of the bill to sort of New York's industrial base be more broad. Um, and then finally, it has to be verifiable. Um, MRV is a term that you'll hear a lot, measurement, reporting, and verification. We have to be able to, to confirm that the CDR is happening and that this, the durability is what it's supposed to be. Finally, and this is in a different colored box because it's so important, the industrial revolution and the fossil fuel economy has been inequitable in terms of its negative externalities on a, on a lot of different communities. When we're doing CDR, we need to make sure that we're in the reverse situation, that we're having as positive social and economic benefits at a community level as possible. So that's really an important factor in, in the New York policy, and it really should be an important factor in any any CDR procurement policy. As I mentioned, standards-based, we are agnostic as to what CDR solution would win in this policy, but here are some examples of ones that are possible. Biochar, I mentioned. Rock dust, we had a great program that maybe Chris can put on the chat from a, a scientist at Cornell University about putting ground up basalt onto agricultural fields as a soil amendment. And that actually, A, um, offers some agricultural co-benefits in terms of improving crop yield, and B, it draws carbon dioxide down from the atmosphere. Um, we all know about direct air carbon capture. Um, there are a lot of exciting ocean carbon capture and ocean CDR pathways that are potentially applicable in New York because we have this fantastic lengthy Long Island coastline. You know, and then sequestration, many of these, many of these um, CDR pathways include their own sequestration, um, the soil carbon pathway, the ocean capture pathways, but direct air capture, for example, results in CO2 that we need to put somewhere. So that can either go underground, and there's some great offshore sequestration opportunities in New York State that happen to coincide with our offshore wind development. And there are also potentially some onshore geological sequestration. Um, and again, we had a great, this is CDR from Dave Goldberg at Columbia to talk about that. And then the other really exciting and more immediately available sequestration opportunity is in the built environment. Um, Mega talked about low embodied carbon concrete. So, you know, in the near term, we could put as much carbon CO2 as we're going to be capturing in the concrete in New York State and probably in most of the other states that, that will be looking at this uh, legislation. Okay, so the policy, um, the idea in New York is that we're going to scale up from zero in uh, now, we're not doing any CDR to speak of. Um, we'll start out, at, let's call it 100,000 tons in 2025, and this will scale up to 61.5 million tons by 2050 to close that CLCPA offset gap I referenced. And 61.5 million tons is 15% the hard to abate component of that 1990 410 million ton baseline. 
And again, this number is going to be different in every state. This is very specific to New York and very specific to the legislation and also very specific to the way that New York is measuring its greenhouse gas baseline. This is a 1990 number. Um, We're actually below that today, thankfully. So there are a lot of different ways to set the targets. But I think, you know, I think we all kind of agree that the most important thing is to get the public sector involved in CDR procurement, because there is no way that uh, we're going to get to gigaton scale of CDR by mid-century if governments are not funding this on some level. From a political perspective, you know, the 25-year program is going to cost a ton of money, tens of billions of dollars. But the first five years is not is going to cost much less. So like, I think from a political perspective, it's important to get something passed and get your state or jurisdiction starting to think about CDR and procuring CDR, however possible. And so in New York, we're looking at a five-year initial authorization. Basically, whatever we can get passed, as long as it's standards-based and actual CDR, we're going we're gonna to try to make that work. So you know, obviously, there are all sorts of political realities. We don't have a price on carbon right now. Ultimately, that would make a lot of sense and use that to fund this, but we have to figure out how to pay for it. And so you know, we have to be practical about the, the sort of the budgetary side of it. As mentioned, Mega alluded to this, that the nice thing, one of the many nice things about procurement is that we can factor in other considerations besides the simple economics of it, the straight price. So in New York, we're actually creating a scorecard that factors in equity, environmental justice, ecosystem services, jobs, you know, here's the in-state preference, durability, but a CDR project that has a thousand year durability would be favored over a CDR project with a hundred years durability, all other things equal. Similarly, a CDR that delivers equity and environmental sort of community benefits to disadvantaged communities, which are defined in the CLCPA legislation in New York, that would be favored. CDR, this is not on the list, but CDR that has great scale potential might be favored over a CDR that has limited scale potential. So we have about eight or 10 different factors besides price that get procuring body in New York can consider when they're making these procurement decisions. And I believe that's about it. So that's the high line. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving a few things out, but that's what we're doing the Q&A for. So. Yeah, let's, let's do the Q&A right now. There's a lot of policy there and people who have different level sort of starting points in terms of their familiarity with CDR and, and some of these policy ideas. So let's do this. It's a relatively small group. Uh, raise your hand if you have a question and we can actually make you into a panelist and you can just ask it live. If you don't want to do that, you can also just put it in the chat. Okay, I'm going to sue right there. Great. Hey there. Um, So I'm buying offsets right now for my college, and I've been looking at what the CDR purchases for Shopify and Stripe and Microsoft and Carbon Cure were and, and, you know, look into the options that they pursued. And a lot of what I'm seeing is not verified, especially type five of the Oxford principles, the really permanent stuff, like even Climeworks is not verified at this point. So I'm wondering, like, what do you see as being possible for the first round of a CDR purchase by New York? And you see it as being like mostly forest carbon starting off? I mean, what's to prevent all the purchases from just being forest carbon, which is the cheapest and verified? The 100-year durability threshold that's written into the legislation will preclude forest carbon in the current sense of it. So, but yeah, MRV is an unsolved issue. One thing to keep in mind is that in New York, at least, the procurement's not starting until 2025. So hopefully we'll be a little further along in that regard, but definitely an open question. Um, all yeah, of I, the would, for- I would argue about the uh, forest carbon not making 100 years, though. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that that forest carbon can certainly, um, if they can prove 100 year durability, then they would be eligible under the policy. It's standards based. So I think it's generally not considered to be durable in that level. But, you know, if it can be proven, then the policy would allow it. Yeah. So given that if you're so what do you see? Do you see like biochar and building materials as as the ones that meet the criteria now or like which potentially? I mean, well, the again, the durability on CLT at the, there's a European marketplace called Puro.Earth and they have CLT at 50 year durability. So um, Chris Magwood, who is one of the, this is CDR presenters that was focused on, um, on sequestration in the built environment. He argued that CLT and other, you know, wood-based building materials, if they're regulated in terms of their reuse and recycling would hit this permanence level. But, 
you know, this is something that the individual proposals are going to have to prove to the state. And um, we're definitely not there yet. And no one who's buying the CDR right now is, you know, it's a big problem for them too. Stripe is funding, you know, in many cases, R&D. So they're kind of funding these nascent efforts. And the hope is that, uh, that it will be further along by um, 2025. One of the key things I think to add there is the unique role of states, uh, both as regulators and the scale of their procurement, that many of these questions that you're asking, Sue, around what are the available options we have today and which ones could be verified, when the state intervenes, they can sort of force or accelerate progress on that. And that's actually really one of the almost short-term, almost one of the primary goals, as Julio Friedman says, to sort of start laying the track down. Uh, so that we know what that looks like is almost more important than the actual volumes of purchasing in the early years, I would say. Um, we do have a couple questions here. One, uh, Toby, this one from Mike uh, Robinson, looks like it has your name all over it. I think I've heard you use uh, ton year before uh, as an expression. Um, so do you want to have have at that question? That'd be great. Um, yeah. Is it in the Q&A box? Oh, yeah. Sure. I can read it. So to address permanence, the unit of ton year has been proposed. This allows flexibility to either make repeated purchases or shorter term solutions or single purchases of, of longer term solutions. Why not use that unit as a basis rather than dictating only the use of century plus solutions? It's a good question. Um, I think that could make sense. It's not what we're doing, um, but it definitely could make sense. Uh, it's uh, it's it's not accepted yet or worked into the market. I'm not clear personally on how Microsoft is buying, for example, NCX credits, which are denominated in 10 years. NCX, it used to be called Sylvia Terra, but they're one of the forest uh, carbon marketplaces. Um, I think it's definitely worth considering, but we don't have that in the bill right now. And it's certainly, you know, something that could be in other bills. It's something that, you know, if we, if we get that feedback, we could potentially add it to our bill. Great. And just before, Andrew, uh, you, you said you had a question about the New York bill, but I would, um, Mike, I'm not sure if you're on our, our Discord yet. And I can also share my email with you, but certainly we would love to hear more about your thinking on that because, again, this policy can evolve as it goes to other places. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, element that we'd love to talk to you further about. So, um, Andrew, uh, you had a question about New York. Yes, I just this is a good opportunity for me to ask you guys to let us know how you're getting on. Give us an idea as to the, the stages that it has to go through and how far away you are and what the political hurdles are. Sure. Um, in short order, we're at the phase right now where we've researched and developed, and even we should say this too, is that we wrote the bill. We wrote a bill. Uh, Jamie Rogers, uh, who's a very active New York-based member, Toby, myself, and a few other people, uh, wrote the legislation, and that was part of getting input. Now we're we're shopping that around, as they say, to legislators in both the Senate and the Assembly. Um, we don't like to jinx ourselves, but we we have a you know we think some positive indications from one uh, Assembly sponsor, and we're doing that, trying to you know the legislative session in New York starts in the beginning of January, so we really as soon as possible to get it at least uh, sponsored in one of the chambers. And then once that happens, you have to have a bill in both chambers that ultimately have to be exactly the same. It goes through a committee process where uh, that are subject related. It might be the Environmental Conservation Committee. It could be the Procurement Committee or a small group of legislators in both chambers review it and then pass it through. Um, sometimes there's multiple committees involved. Uh, and then once it's gone through the committees, then it's ready to get voted on. And this, in New York at least, um, suspensefully, uh, probably about 75 percent of all bills get passed at the in the eleventh hour of this session in June, although there's a, a, a history of of environmental bills getting passed uh, around Earth Day as well, uh, which is also when the budget period happens. So we have a long way to go in front of ourselves, but the just critically important thing that gives this thing life is to get it sponsored. So that's our main priority. In parallel to trying to educate legislators, we're, we will be building a coalition of other organizations who also say they support it and sometimes can bring resources to bear on the campaign, like they have membership or they have relationships with legislators. So we have a long way to go. And if you, you jump into a mission in any state, there's a process that uh, you'll learn about. Um, it's almost like a game. It really is. It has very distinct stages of you know, winning and losing. And uh, we're in sort of the first quarter. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It does. Thank you very much. Great. And Andrew, really eager to hear, you know, we're familiar because we've got a great group of members in uh, the UK. It's obviously very different um, in terms of the processes there, but there's no reason why CDRLA couldn't 
you know, permutate and, and, you know, potentially make its way through that process on the other side of the pond. So it, it, it's actually not so different. Um, we have two chambers as well. Bills go through one and then the other. But apart from that, it's a, a very similar process. And um, we have one Green MP. One, <laughs> and she's a stand. She's an absolute classic for getting this through. It would be great. Unfortunately, she's putting all her energy into an existing one, which has been going on for a couple of years. So uh, it's just a matter of of getting the timing right. Uh, but there's every chance that um, we'll be pushing very hard to have something like this in the UK. I love it. Um, <laughs> and we know one thing. I want to say is this. I think is important is that there's a lot of detail here, and it sounds very wonky. But one thing to always just remember is that. You know, Toby is a uh, business consultant. Uh, Mega works in the gaming industry. Uh, I don't have, you know, I come from a solar background. Um, but once you get into this, um, I think what you just heard from Toby and Mega is a reflection of just, we, these are learnable things. And not only are they learnable things, we can come up with really good ideas. We don't need to wait for the quote unquote experts to do that. And so if you stick around a little bit, you'll be surprised uh, how quickly these acronyms will make sense. And uh, you'll be right in the thick of it in terms of thinking about policy on a pretty minute level. So that's one of the fun things I think uh, about open air um, is, is really getting into the weeds. So why don't we go ahead and do this? I think I can switch into, we're talking about some campaign stuff. I, I'm just going to give an overview of where we are in, in different states. Uh, it's exciting because there's a lot going on actually uh, already um, in particularly in California and New York, but as well as other states. And we're all, we have a really great membership base kind of all over the place, many of them in states that we think are really um, fruitful. As uh, Toby and Mega mentioned uh, at the top, this is a multi-state mission. And the way Open Air works is wherever we have members and wherever there's opportunities and wherever groups can be formed, that's where it's going to spread. And as it spreads, it's going to change. As we described, it has to start somewhere. And so the New York bill that we wrote is where it started. That's the origin policy. Um, but then it goes to different places uh, after that. And as it uh, transitions to different places, it can, as we said, change to what's appropriate within that local context. You know, in New York, we're going for like a really ambitious goal, but we think that's appropriate because New York has the most ambitious climate law on the books next to California. Um, so we think we can shoot for, you know, or swing for the fences there. Other states might want to go with something that's um, sort of smaller and more doable and more in line with um, politically what's possible or what's possible from a climate policy perspective. And so as they move, they can spread and to use a, you know, a software open source term, fork, turn into different versions of different uh, of the bill. And so one thing I just want to mention, we get this a lot from people sometimes when we talk about the sort of the spreading of the bill. Some people with activism background that follow politics might be familiar with ALEC, uh, sort of a notorious, somewhat secretive organization uh, called the American Legislative Exchange Council that was really run by lobbyists and funded by, you know, corporations and uh, right-wing conservative uh, philanthropies. But they would develop legislation at the state and even local level and then distribute it through their networks to other legislators. So it was a kind of a similar model in terms of that they would develop the policy and then horizontally uh, spread it. Um, and, you know, we're like that, but we're, uh, we're a distributed network of volunteers who are doing it and do it in a very transparent way. But it's a similar idea of trying to, again, horizontally push it out. And we actually uh, are going to be putting our, our new website is going to launch on Halloween. And if you're familiar with GitHub, which is a, a platform where you share open source software, where people can then change and ask for changes to it, we're actually going to put our bills up on GitHub as well. So that's a way of making them totally public. That's something that there are legislators actually around the world and municipalities that are already doing that. Um, and so the, what we're following with our rule book or our playbook for CDRLA is informed by our experience with LECLA, which was our first legislative initiative that Mega referenced at the top of the presentation. We got a version of that um, introduced that I led the sort of research and writing, but there were other people that were involved in that um, way back in June, 2019. Then Sue and some other folks in New Jersey, about a um, you know a year less than a year later, um, said, "Hey, I think I can get that introduced in New Jersey." So they took the bill and very promptly got it introduced with a great sponsor in New Jersey. Now, what also happened at the same time, as we were trying to work through our advocacy in New York, we had some municipalities that were interested in doing a similar thing. That wasn't part of the original plan. In a little uh, town north of New York City called Hastings passed a resolution that said that they would 
um, consider procuring low carbon concrete that led to a few local projects. And then another one of our members saw that who's based in Michigan and then took that and got that introduced and that's been passed in Ann Arbor. So um, this is the way things sort of spread and evolve over time. And the most recent development here is that the New York bill changed uh, for what was sort of politically possible in New York. And so that was a new version that then got passed in June. And then in Virginia, one of our activists, uh, Nikhil, is just a, a breath away from getting a version of LECLA introduced in Virginia. And we're still trying to figure out, as I said, what's the appropriate version of the policy for Virginia, given the realities there. So that's how it, it, it happened. But the key thing is these things didn't just happen by themselves. Um, you know, as I said, I was involved in the, the first LECLA bill. Um, another member of ours named uh, um, Eon, who I'm really happy to see is, is actually watching right now, is the one who came up with the idea of a, of a local version of it for Hastings, and he moved that forward. Uh, Luca Henrion uh, was the one in, in uh, Michigan who then took that and got it introduced in Ann Arbor. Uh, Sue was the person who reached out to us and became uh, a member uh, and then got started getting things done in New Jersey. And then Nikhil is the one who's driving it. So it's all people driven, uh, just to demystify it a bit. And then each of these people then set up a small group um, to start to drive it because you can't do it by yourself. And then there's just all sorts of people. When you come into Discord, you'll see some of our active members or participants in these uh, groups. And groups are not massive things. Our experience is you really want some hardcore people that are committed to it. Typically, they're you know, about five members. They can be more, they can be less, but they're pretty intimate. Um, we have channels on Discord where people can keep talking uh, about developments. And then Typically, everything's tied together with a weekly Zoom where we jump on those calls and we, we talk about uh, progress, set forward our tasks and our targets and, and do our planning. And so that's kind of what the, the group dynamic is like. And again, Lekla got us kicked off. We're like, all right, there's, there's something to this. Toby really kind of stepped up and said, how about this? And then that was how the CDRLA idea came. And in parallel to this, we also have two other policy initiatives uh, that are in the works. One is a New York City specific uh, incentive for, for carbon tech. And then another one, which we're really excited about is a European policy that's being driven by one of our members uh, in Luxembourg, who happens to be a member of parliament in Luxembourg. And so as we grow as a network, we want to keep expanding the different types of policies that we're trying to advance on uh, different levels. And again, CDRLA, we think the basic mechanism could be adapted to sort of work really anywhere. Um, and that's really what we'd like to see happen. So we have in New York right now, as we mentioned, um, really good conversations going. We, we are optimistic about getting a bill uh, introduced in New York relatively soon. Also talking to a really great climate forward senator uh, in California. So that conversation's uh, already happening. Um, in Colorado, we've presented it to a great representative in uh, there that has just introduced some really, really effective environmental legislation that's passed. Also really interested in opportunities in Arizona. You got Arizona State University, which is the home of the Carbon uh, Negative uh, Emissions Center. Um, and we have some great members there, as well as some interest from ASU in potentially pushing a bill forward in Arizona. Um, we have great opportunities in New Jersey. Uh, we already have a version of the bill that's been uh, sent to some staff uh, within the Senate there. So looking to next year to maybe get something going. And then some potential national activity that just is at the most nascent stage where some of our members, you just heard from Andrew, are considering uh, what we can do there. And so it's just going to spread as uh, we have members and groups form. And again, we might have these separate campaigns that are happening, but the key strength for us is if we're all connected on the back end on our Discord, sharing notes, sharing tactics, learning from each other, sharing best practices, we think we can get this done simultaneously all over the place. And so I'll just leave it on this level. So right now the CDRLA group um, meets on Thursdays at 1130 Eastern is our planning. So we get into the weeds on this. As we grow, we'll see if that sort of separates into small state groups having their own meetings. Uh, we'll sort of play that by ear. Um, and again, for in terms of what people could do uh, to answer Tina's question, you know, as I mentioned, groups are relatively small. Uh, they don't need to be really large. The types of things that we focus on, we're not like a mass mobilization organization. We're not a protest organization. Uh, we don't you know, organize uh, marches or direct actions. We're in favor of those types of methods when they're, when they're um, called for, and maybe we do evolve in that direction. But for right now, we kind of play a different, more targeted role. Um, we are 
uh, policy development, as we just explained. Uh, we did all the research and even wrote the bill. Uh, so we want to be the ones who are coming up with creative new ideas that the, the environmental organizations or the other organizations aren't thinking of. Uh, we want to fill that void. And we're doing that, I think, uh, in a really impressive way. Thanks to, you know, Toby and Jamie and Mega and, and folks. Um, and then what we do is we have our members, I know it seems daunting right now, but we're the ones who learn how the policy works. And we make the direct ask to legislators and to other organizations who we want to get on board. So we schedule calls. Uh, we will do some lobbying days now that, that that's possible in different states. Uh, that's when you actually go to, you know, the Capitol or to the legislative buildings. But we use a lot of Zoom, uh, 20, 30 minute calls. And we'll give a version of the presentation that you saw earlier today and just try to cover the whole state wherever we are, focusing on the most influential legislators. And, and we, we do that. Um, and then the last thing is, is we want to start, you know, being more active on, you know, we do a lot of webinars uh, for different uh, types of folks that are with different interests. We've um, written op eds that we've gotten introduced, um, you know, so we want to start sort of taking control of the messaging and reporting on what's happening with this policy. So that's kind of the, the bundle of activities that, that we really do as activists. Um, and then in terms of when you join a group, we're seeing a kind of a division of labor, I guess you could sort of say that, you know, we're testing out particularly in one of our bills with that New York City bill, but um, what do you sort of need to get a group going? You know, you need someone who kind of stands up and says, you know, I'm going to be the one who kind of gets this on the board. I'm going to kind of be the manager or the moderator, uh, we, we, we say. And that can be jointly shared by multiple people, but you need somebody who's ultimately accountable, who sets the Zoom meeting, uh, who, who gets the Google Doc out, um, who's kind of um, project managing. Uh, researchers, you know, this is a research intensive thing, not just to develop the policy, but as we get into advocacy, you're trying to find out who are the different groups you want to bring on board? Who's your opposition? Uh, what are the emerging technologies that are particularly relevant to a certain state? So every week, there's different sort of knowledge that we're trying to grow to be more effective. Advocates are the center. That's what I just described. These are the folks who are comfortable giving the pitch, and they're the ones who are going to go schedule time with legislators and with um, uh, organizations to try to convince them to support it. So the more advocates we can have, the better. This is the real, where the rubber hits the road. Um, recruiters, this is another piece that we're, uh, I see Nick has joined. We were talking about this the other day. In addition to advocates, having, as we discover, what are our needs around, again, who do we have to recruit both from citizen side or companies, or is there somebody with a certain expertise can, that can answer a nagging question can those folks go out during the week on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and try to identify people and sort of bring them into the fold uh, when we need them? Um, so people with sales backgrounds or headhunting backgrounds or who are just comfortable sort of doing that kind of outreach, uh, really effective at that. And then one of the things that, particularly with the new website coming on in a couple of weeks, we want to be telling our own story. So if you're a writer or a blogger and you want to do basically have CDRLA as your beat, we would love to have you writing about developments. And then having other people, those of us who are good at social media on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, amplifying that, making sure we send that out, directing it at people who we want to see it. And so this is kind of the core set of functions that a group really should be able to have, I think, to, to be effective. And um, then there's other roles if you're kind of, you know, thinking, you know, I want to sort of wade into this a little bit. There are moments where we can use your help doing simple things like retweet this, you know, or call your own legislator, you know, or attend a meeting that one of our advocates is going to be leading as a constituent. So there's sort of more passive, low level commitment things that people will be able to participate. And then creators, you know, this deck that we're showing right now is based on the graphic design that one of our members um, in Denmark uh, did. You know, we always need graphic designers, people who have artistic abilities, can edit video. And, you know, you could be involved across all the different missions, you know, potentially help out in that way. And just to wrap up, I shared the form there that, again, if you're interested in finding out more, again, you're not signing your life away here. There's many ways to be involved. But if what we've shared today has provoked your curiosity and you might want to be involved, fill out that form uh, and let us know what you're thinking. And then I'll get back to you by tomorrow and we'll start to get people together in groups based on state. And the initial thing, again, not to be too daunted, is we're going to be uh, answering. You come into the Discord, you can ask these questions. We can go into great depth because our membership is getting smarter and smarter about these issues. And so these are things that you can learn. Um, so um, fill out what your interest level is. And then in terms of the next stages, um, 
Right now, we're looking at, you know, we've got a nice group uh, that's a core group in, in uh, New York and one that's forming in California, but we want to form up those, those groups on the state level. Um, and then you look at, well, how do we adapt the policy in the bill to meet these needs? So there's a bit of a research phase. And then we can take the materials that we've already developed for New York, Mega's already uh, adapting them to California and adapt them to the different states. And then once we have that, we're good to go out into the world and start making the case start trying to get the bill introduced, approach uh, sponsors, um, and then uh, the campaign begins. Uh, once we get a bill introduced, it's about picking up as many uh, legislators, um, trying to tell our story, try to influence media representation, and try to recruit other organizations to join our co coalition. And that, that's the model we've been using with LECLA that we draw on other you know, sort of um, forms of established organizing. But that's what we're looking at for stages. And again, if you join, you're not doing it alone. You become part of a community where you can we can all learn collectively. So that is the kind of overview. Tina, I hope that started to uh, answer some of your questions. Um, but those of you who are not on Discord yet, but want to join our Discord, we can have a little after party here, or you can ask any of us questions at any time about the mission. You know, don't be afraid, you know, to come on and ask questions. So, and I see some people here, Mike, that's great to hear. We will be in touch about Washington and Oregon, two great uh, potential states uh, for a CDRLA. Thanks, uh, Sue, for the correction on the date. And I think that's pretty much all we had. We're at time. Hopefully that helps you guys understand what we're doing. And thank you, everybody. I don't know if my, my co-presenters have any last words before we jump off. No, thanks, everyone, for joining. Great to have you guys. And hope to see some of you on Discord. Great. Thanks, guys. Bye.